I'm going to talk about some of the categories I mentioned before. Like last week when we were in the medical school, I mentioned a couple of strong women that I was going to pick up on a little bit more. So I will talk about them because they actually changed history for women, not only here in Edinburgh, but for women throughout the United Kingdom. Because these were the first women to graduate from a British university and the struggle that they had. I'm also going to pick up on a story we mentioned before. You've heard me talk about the grave stealers, Mr Burke and Mr Hare. Well, Mr Burke and Mr Hare would steal the bodies and he would sell them to the university. This is where the bodies would end up in the main, because you needed your bodies for the anatomy classes. Some of the students had, were tasked to go and find their own bodies. So the students had to go out and dig up the graves of the freshly buried bodies and bring them in. That's the only way they were going to learn. So the industry built up. Mr Burke and Mr Hare started to grip got a wee bit crazy. Um, instead of waiting for the bodies to be buried, they went out on the kill and they turned it even to bigger industries. So the corpses were getting fresher and fresher. Now we know the story about Mr Burke and Mr Hare. Uh, Mr Hare turned the Queen's evidence or King's evidence on Mr Burke. Mr Burke was then put on trial. And when he was put on trial, he was hung by the neck and his body was used for experimentation here at Edinburgh University. When he was hung, they immediately made a death mask of him and they've got the death mask in here, in this museum. It's a very macabre museum. I would highly recommend it you go in here. It's very Victorian in its regards. There's pickled things in there you never thought you'd ever see in your life. All in pickled jars going back to the 18th and 19th, right up to the 20th century. But apart from that, when they got Mr Burke up here, um, he was used for experimentation, so he was anatomised. They took the skin off him, and from the skin of his backside, they actually made a wallet. So you can actually see the wallet that's made from the skin of Mr. Burke's backside in there as well. As I say, it's a very macabre a museum. But I want to mention some of the other people who changed the way of life here in Edinburgh. And I'm particularly going to talk about what's known as the Edinburgh Seven. So if we just walk along this way, the Edinburgh Seven were a group of women the leader of the group was a woman known as Sophia Jex Blake. I'm going to get my names out here because I want to just name them all because I think it's worthwhile to name these women because I'm a great supporter of strong women. As I mentioned before, I grew up with six sisters. I could only be supportive of strong women, otherwise I'd get it. So Sophia Jex Blake was the leader and I'll explain a wee bit more about her. Then there was Elizabeth Thorne. There was Edith Peachy, we'll go in this way, Mike. Yeah. Uh, there's Matilda Chaplin, Helen Evans, Mary Anderson, and Emily Bovell. Now that is a great roll call. So we're talking back in the 1860s. <clears throat> Sophia Jex Blake wrote to the university and said, I want to come and study anatomy at Edinburgh University. The faculty had never had a woman study here before. The whole university had never had a woman study here before. But she did get a bit of support. However, the faculty gave her support, but the university court said no, because they'd have to make all these changes to educate women. You know, separate toilets, they didn't know how the, you know, the men would react, or the women in the class, etc. In fact, the men reacted very, very badly. <clears throat> so they said, no, you cannot join the university because we're not making all those changes for one woman. So Sophia was not deterred. She wrote to the Scotsman newspaper and other newspapers throughout the United Kingdom and said she wanted to go to Edinburgh University or any other women who wanted to join her. And then very shortly, the replies came in and there was four initially, so that made five of the women got together and they then went back to the university. They were then latterly joined by another two to make it the Edinburgh Seven. The university had to change because there was pressure coming from outside the university and also from professors inside. Even Charles Darwin supported the women to come to the university. So they enrolled, they did, they did their entrance exams, they had to do entrance exams in those days. They had to do an exam in anatomy, Latin and maths. It wasn't easy to get in, but four of the seven were in the top five of all the exam people who did their exams. There's 150 people who took their exams, seven of them are women, and four of those women were top of the class. 
and one of them won the scholarship. Now the women were being charged extra, they had to pay more than the men because it meant being educated privately. So the girls matriculated. So the young women came here and they did their matriculation and they got into the university. However, about two years into the course, they were coming in here, into this building, and they came down the street that we were on, and there was a massive crowd of men and women from the city outside. What ensued was a riot. The university closed the doors on the seven women, and they stood up there, and they were pelted with horse dung, with dirt, with stones, if those women stood there, they were coming in to do their exams and they were pelted by not only the locals but also by the students. They also the male students were doing other things, they were th putting red paint on seats and the whole thing, so that when they were coming with their costumes or with their dresses on, they were having red paint on their backside when they left, so they were being mocked, or they were being abused, but they stood by it. However, the sting in the tail was that they got back in here, they did their exams, they passed their exams. They did very, very well. However, the university court refused them graduation. So they could matriculate to come into the university, but they were not allowed to graduate. Not one of them graduated. It wasn't until a few years later, when the seven of them dispersed throughout the United Kingdom, some went down to London, some went to Dublin, some went over to, to Switzerland and France. They all graduated outside of the United Kingdom, they got the degrees, but then they came back here to Edinburgh. So Sophia Jekt Blake came back here and set up the Women's College to teach women. And that was the first university in Great Britain that ever allowed women to enter, but did not allow them to graduate. But they stood by it and that changed the world for women in education throughout the United Kingdom. The act was passed in the 1870s, allowing entry for all women into all universities in Scotland. So I like these stories of the radical women. I think they were great. I'm going to talk about some more. We're going to move on from this hallowed building here. I love Surgeons Hall. It's one of the great places to come to. It's open up. Um, I've had a few business meetings in here. You can rent it. People get married in here. We're going to come back onto Nicholson Street and I'm going to walk down, take you into the oldest part. Well, not the oldest, but an older part of the university of Edinburgh. I'm going to take you into the old college itself. Now I mentioned in the previous talks that the university was established in the 1500s. Edinburgh University was known as the first secular university. Secular doesn't mean non-religious. It means it didn't need a papal bull to be established. Scotland had become a Presbyterian country. Prior to that, you needed permission from the Pope to open a university in the country. However, after the, after the Reformation, it wasn't needed. Edinburgh was established by the Town Council. So established back in the 1500s. It was the fourth oldest in Scotland. The first was in Andrews, early 1400s, I said before. Second was Glasgow, 1451. And then the third was Aberdeen. So Mike's giving you a little scan of some of the clothes this year. There's a restaurant, and Mike will pick it up in a minute here, called Spoon. Now Spoon has been here. It used to be called Nicholson's because we're on Nicholson Street. But Spoon has been associated with J.K. Rowling's. So just up above here is where J.K. Rowling's actually started off her career writing the Harry Potter books. Now the literature connections will continue here because this is so 20th century with Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling's. But I want to take you over to this absolutely glorious little pub. Now Edinburgh is famous for its pubs. Bearing in mind that we're just across the street from the old college at the university. Well, the old college itself was the main part of the university, right up until about the late 1800s. And there were so many famous people that studied in the old college, and we're going to go in there. But some of the people who studied in there used to come drinking in here. And it's this bar, Michael Pegg up there, was established in 1834. 
And the people who used to frequent this are all remembered here. So uh, we've mentioned before, I've mentioned Robert Louis Stevenson. So he wrote Treasure Island, Robert Street, the ship. It's called the Hispaniola. The interior of this restaurant, which is an Italian restaurant, is actually done up like the inside of the Hispaniola itself. Arthur Conan Doyle also drank in here and J.M. Barry as well. So again, some literary connections going back to the end of the 1800s. And then we got across the street with J.K. Rowling's as well. And I'm just going to pick up here. It's a very sad day for a lot of people yesterday because one of Edinburgh's famous citizens, I'm sure you all know Sean Connery, he died yesterday. Sean Connery also has association with art in Edinburgh as well. Uh, he started his career off as a milkman before he became famous. He was a bodybuilder. Um, but he also worked at the Edinburgh College of Art. Now I mentioned that the university was established in the 1500s. By the middle of the 1700s, the university buildings were getting very dilapidated. So at the end of the 1700s, a petition was made out to raise taxation to actually refurbish the university, to rebuild, take down the dilapidated buildings, and they were successful. So in the 1700s, taxes were raised locally, and they started to build college. The old college uh, was designed initially by Robert Adam. Robert Adam was part of a very famous family of architects. I don't want to call them the Adams family, it sounds a bit crass, a bit like Morticia and Thing and all that. But they were the Adam family. And uh, they are probably best known for the building of the new town in Edinburgh. Famous, famous architect firm. However, by the late 1700s, Britain had was war with France during the Napoleonic Wars. The building stopped. In the meantime, Robert Adam had died and uh, everything was put on hold. However, after the war, more tax was raised from the city and competition was held again, and William Playfair. Now, you mentioned Will William Playfair, we talked about Surgeon's Hall. So William Playfair won the contract to finish the work that was started by Robert Adam. So this is the old college of Edinburgh. This is now the law faculty. When we talk about faculties in Scotland and in Britain, we actually talk about the departments. I know some parts of the English-speaking world, the faculty means the deans or the court. Here it means the department or the school. So this is a law school. And just take a have a look around at the architecture here. Very grand, very peaceful. And again, cold. Zams here. <laughs> I did my MBA, I did my law exams in here as well. And have a look at the dome you can see up there. At the top of the dome, sparkling in the sun, you might pick up the gold statue. The gold statue is actually represents youth. And that's what it's called, it's called youth. Have a look at the classic columns here. We've got all the different types. Ionic, Corinthian. Very flash. Edinburgh is a very, very, very wealthy university. And to this day, they still send me begging letters. <laughs> I should start sending Edinburgh University some begging letters. Let's see if I can get anything from them. But there's another person I want to talk about. And it's J.M. Barry. And I'm not talking about J.M. Barry, the author. This is James Barry. This is about 100 years before J.M. Barry, the author. When Barry was young, it was said that he always said he wanted to be a doctor and he wanted to be a soldier. He was born in Ireland, came over to Britain. Um, his father had died, his uh, mother and his uh, brother came over to live in London initially and uh, their mother was very again positive about women being educated and uh, so was driving this education into her children. So Barry came up to Edinburgh University 
has studied medicine. We're talking at the end of the 1700s again. She studied, he studied medicine, came up here, and then became a medical doctor in the army. He saw many wars as Britain was an imperial power, and we were fighting wars everywhere, and Barry went all around the world, um, Africa, and even in C Crimea. Um, he knew Florence Nightingale. And when he died, he asked that his clothes would never be taken off him. That was his dying wish. However, at the mortuary, when they were preparing for his, bu his, his burial, when they took the clothes off him, they actually realised that he was a man, he was a woman. Her, the real name of J. Barry, or J. James Barry, is actually Margaret Ann Buckley from, the, from Ireland. So although we talked about the seven women breaking down the barriers here, this woman disguised herself for her whole life as a man to enter into medical school here, and she graduated. So although the, these Edinburgh Seven never got to graduate, J. Barry, or Margaret Ann Bulkley from Ireland, did graduate a hundred years before the women. So again, pioneering in many regards. To all intents and purposes, it said that um, he, she was not a very nice person. In fact, Florence Nightingale had not a single kind word to say about him. Um, she has written to a newspaper complaining about Barry when Barry's real sex and real gender was revealed. She wrote, Florence Nightingale wrote to the newspaper saying that she had never met such a blagger in all of her life. He berated Florence Nightingale on a parade ground in the middle of the heat in Crimea and she never really forgave Barry for that. But I just thought it's a very, very interesting story about how this woman had to disguise herself to get what she wanted in the 1700s. She died, some say she died of dysentery, some say she died of uh, the flu. But she's remembered here at Edinburgh University. If we just walk over this way, Mike. And it states, Edinburgh University, in honour of James Miranda Barry. We don't know when she was really born, but they're given the date of 1795 and died 1865. Army surgeon and inspector general of hospitals in Canada, lived as a man and believed to be the first woman graduate of the university in 1812. So hats off to James and Miranda Barry. There's a really good play that the BBC did um, about uh, Barry is on radio. I think you can get it. You can still get it if you tune into the BBC and then search through the archives. We can do it in Britain, and you'll get the story of James and Miranda Barry. I think it's a great story to bring out, and I think again, an intrepid woman having to do what she had to do to fulfil her own dream, and that meant covering up the, her whole life. And when they actually did take the clothes off, they did find stretch marks on her, so they actually believed that she had a baby, and they think that the baby. It was a result of her being raped by her uncle back in Ireland. And when she gave birth to the baby, the baby got adopted by the mother. So there's another backstory behind that as well. Let's move on. We'll take you down to another part of the university, which is the oldest part of the university. And it's the original medical school, which is still standing. So it'll be another five or ten minutes. But I thought you'd just love to come in here and Okay, good look. I hope you enjoy the old college of Edinburgh University. I did mention there are four universities here in Edinburgh. Now Walter Scott also studied in here. You've mentioned, I've mentioned Walter Scott. So Walter Scott would have studied in here. Robert Lee Stevenson, as I mentioned, Jane Barry was in here, all in this part of the university. Because although now it is a law department, this was the main part of the university back in the 17 and 1800s. So, we mentioned Burke and Hare, the body stealers. Well, I'm going to take you down to the part of the hospital where the bodies actually did what arrive at. And the Royal Oak itself, if you go into the Royal Oak pub, Two floors down, you get the old streets of Edinburgh because there's actually a tunnel that goes from one of the less salubrious parts of Edinburgh, which it was in those days, 
called the Cannon Gate, and this is where the murders took place. And the bodies were then transported underground through the secret tunnels to the medical schools down here. So Edinburgh Un University owns a lot of the property in this area. Now I want to um, point at this building here, if Mike can maybe go across the street and you'll get a good uh, view of this one here. We're in the street called Infirmary Street right now. And in Infirmary Street they had what was known as the Infirmary Street Baths. Now these were Victorian baths. In it they had a swimming pool, but they also had old-fashioned baths where you could actually go in a big old tub and you could have a bath. You would have a bath once a week whether you needed it or not. Some people would get it once, once a month. And the apartment that I lived in when I first came up to Edinburgh, when I moved into the flat, we didn't have a bath that was in an operation, so we had to come here to the baths. The baths are now closed, and it's now a tapestry studio. And if you're interested in anything to do with wool or tapestry, this is a great place to come and visit. It's open to the public, and you can watch um, the artists at work. You can go above the workshops and look down to the artists. I would highly recommend it. It's very understated, but it's a very, very popular place here in Edinburgh. Nice little cafe in it as well. And you can buy your yarns as well. I know there's a lot of people who come to Scotland and when they are in Scotland, they want to buy some yarn. I like coming in here and watching the artists at work. Now the last place we're going to take you to as I mentioned before, is the oldest part of the university that's still standing here. I mentioned when we're in the old medical school, we refer to it as the old med medical school we were at last week. Um, that was built just a, about half a mile from here. But this building's here where the original medical school and this is the original infirm Royal Infirmary. Mike's already mentioned uh, Dr. Syme and Joseph Lister. Well, they actually tended the wards in here. Joseph Lister was the man who came up with um, antiseptic. Prior to Joseph Lister, if you went into hospital, you weren't likely to come out of a hospital because you got all the hospital infections. But with the development of antisepsis, antisepsis here at Edinburgh University, um, let's just say there was less of a body count in terms of people did manage to come out of the, out of the the wards after being treated or operated upon. I'm going to take you into the people very rarely come in here but I'm going to take you into a little secret quad. Now another famous woman I wanted to mention was a woman called Elsie Ingalls. Now Elsie Ingalls uh, was a pioneer in many respects. She actually studied under Sophia Jex Blake but she didn't like Jex Blake. She thought she was far too authoritarian, far too strict. So she stuck in her work. Um, she was also a pioneer for, the, for women's vote, so she was a militant suffragette, whereas Jex Blake was not. Jex Blake didn't really like the idea um, of her students going out demonstrating in the streets here of Edinburgh for, for female suffrage. Um, so Elsie Ingalls herself um, became a famous doctor, physician. She went down to London and uh, then came back up to Edinburgh and set up another women's medical school in competition with Sophia Jex Blake. And Elsie Ingalls got recognised by the university because she had graduated from Edinburgh and she became associated with this medical school here. So this now doubles up as the Geography Department of Ge Geosciences. And I just want to take you to finish off here. I want to take you to this old building here, which stands from the 1700s. And this is the original hall here. And we've got a little plaque here for Elsie Ingalls as well. She's founder of the Scottish Women's Suffrage Feder Federation and Scottish Women's Hospitals. And she was a graduate of the university here. And going back to the 1600s, in 1697, the Edinburgh surgeons moved from their former meeting place in Edinburgh, part of Edinburgh, to this building here. So this goes back to 1697. And here they conducted their business until they moved to the old school, which opened in 1832. 
So it's a walking history tour here of medicine of great people. I um, hope you've enjoyed it. Just above the pediment, there's the date of 1697, just to tell you of when this building was built. And here you got where medicine and anatomy and everything that Edinburgh University was famous for all started here.